There's a phenomenon that I've noticed and also been more and more taking note of in recent years that I don't quite have a name for the closest thing that I've settled onto it in, you know, talking about it in AMA sessions and occasional other places is that some classic and contemporary philosophical texts have what I would call a kind of aura to them. They become, you could say, within the intellectual sphere, a kind of commodity, right? Something that is referenced, something that is sampled, something that is traded upon, invoked, but oftentimes not actually read, or for those who do the reading, sometimes not adequately understood. I'll give you a prime example of a text that I think has this kind of stature. And I do want to say ahead of time, all of these texts I think are worth reading and they're, um, you know, not to be just discarded as being jargon or a bunch of, you know, poorly formed, strung together ideas or anything like that. All of them are worth reading. But I think a lot of people don't actually read the text and get a lot more out of glosses on them. So here's, here's a prime example of a text like that. Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, right? This is the Miller translation. There have been three new recent translations in English that have come out in the last several years, and there's earlier translations as well. Um, this is a great book, right? It's not the key to everything. And may maybe that's another thing that we can say about these texts with auras is that so many people take them as if they're like, this is the definitive work that you must read or you're not understanding philosophy. You're not doing philosophy in a meaningful way. I mean, before Hegel, people were clearly doing philosophy uh, maybe not in exactly the same way that Hegel was, but it's not as if there wasn't great value in the discipline before that. And you don't have to be a Hegelian or even a constant reader of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit in order to do many things in philosophy quite well and interestingly and, you know, rigorously. Um, this is one possible way to go. And this is only one of Hegel's books, too. I mean, this was not a particularly important book in the 19th century by comparison to the 20th and the 21st century where this one became like the book to to go to certainly at least in the english speaking world for hegel fanciers right and uh, so this is this is a great example of a text people think that oh there's so much in here but many people only read little sections of it and they find that difficult, like the master-slave dialectic, right? Um, the master-slave dialectic, by the way, is just a tiny, tiny... I'm actually going to include not... We'll just include lordship and bondage in here, right? And so that's this amount of this entire text. So if you're not reading the rest of it, and you're bringing up Hegel's master slave dialectic all the time, you got to ask, well, what are you doing? You know, or if you bring up the unhappy consciousness, or if you bring up his discussion of Antigone, or if you bring up, and we could go on and on and on and on, right? So this is a prime example of a text with that kind of aura. I would say the majority of people that I see on social media bringing up Hegel focus on this text as if it's like, the go-to place for philosophy and very often betray that they don't know much about it. What would be some other similar texts? Well, here's another prime example that I think the German idealists themselves sometimes appeal to, Benedict Spinoza's Ethics, right? Very interesting text, um, worth reading. A lot of people get on my case because I, I haven't done videos about it, but I haven't done videos on many, many philosophers, but this is the most requested one. And, you know, you think to yourself, well, what is so attractive about this incredibly convoluted, um, arranged in a really weird presentation style, this more geometrico, which essentially uh, puts out a, a 
metaphysics that is hard to buy into and, um, you know, uh, uh, views on the human emotions that I certainly myself don't, don't accept. Uh, what is so attractive about this? Almost like, you know, a black hole sucking everything else into it. Well, you know, I think this is a text that, just like the phenomenology, has a stellar reputation, and a lot of people are paying more attention to the reputation than what's actually contained in the text, let alone having a fairly comprehensive understanding of what the overall philosophy there is. And here's another prime example. You know, this is often Kant's critique of pure reason, the first critique viewed as like, well, if you haven't read that, then you haven't actually studied philosophy. Kant is such an important uh, transition figure. Philosophy can't be the same again after Kant. And, you know, if you know your history of philosophy, you can be like, well, sure it can. I mean, he's very important, but so many other people are very important throughout history. And yeah, there's some really cool stuff going on in this that leads to some, you know, interesting discussions and adaptations and interpretations and controversies and all that. And, you know, there's a sort of comprehensive picture of the world, us as human beings, our faculties, how we know things given in here. I mean, it's a great book, right? It's, it's well worth reading, but it's not the be all and end all of philosophy any more than Spinoza's ethics or Hegel's phenomenology are. It's not even the be all and end all of Kant's works. I mean, given the chance to, to reread the critique of pure reason or to reread either of the other two critiques, I'm always choosing the other critiques because I find them more interesting myself. But this is the one that everybody hears about and they're like, oh yes, I, I definitely have to make time to, to read this. I've had quite a few tutorial students who will, you know, get in touch with me and they're like, I want to do tutorials with you. I want to read this book. And I'll be like, are you sure that's the one, the single thing that you really want to concentrate on the most? Well, I've heard it's so important. Well, how do you know? that it's so important until you actually get into it and you read it and you see whether it is so or not. Um, another prime contender, you know, as we're moving forward from Hegel, Karl Marx, right? I mean, how many people who call themselves Marxists and, and the people who call themselves Marxists are often very, very committed, aren't they? They uh, think that, that, you know, this is really central to um, how we should understand everything. Like, this is the book. It's not uh, the critique of pure reason. It's not Hegel's phenomenology. It's this instead. How many of them have actually read their way through this, let alone assimilated it and understand it, understood it? Probably not that many, right? Um, it, it assumes, it, you know, you could say that all of these books assume the kind of importance that many people accord to religious texts like the Bible, which itself is a composite of all these different works written at different times, often, you know, kind of uh, illuminating, but at cross purposes with each other. People act as if the book itself is somehow, you know, going to change your life and you you need to adapt yourself to it it's it's authoritative in an interesting way and we can talk about other things from the 20th century i've just got a few here that i think are not given that sort of status anymore but have been treated at one point or another as if they're like absolutely centrally important and invoked but often not talked about great example Heidegger's being in time, right? I mean, the most interesting thing for me in this is the four aqua primordials. Um, if you don't know what that is, well, you know, maybe you have read being in time, but you didn't pay close enough attention to that. Uh, being towards death is a cool idea, but, you know, that's just one possible uh, comportment, right, that, that comes out of that. There's all sorts of other things in here that get brought up occasionally, you know, let's talk about this, let's talk about that, you know, the 
the Das Mann, right? That's sort of like the catchphrase of, um, you know, talking about the master-slave dialectic or pick whatever else that you, you want. So, I mean, a lot of people made a big deal out of being in time in the past, maybe less so nowadays. Um, two others that were viewed as like, oh, these are the must-see, must-read, must-go-to books, Wittgenstein's Philosophical Investigations. Um, this one's particularly thick because it's got the German on one side and the English on the other, which is very nice to be able to consult. But, I mean, when you read the Philosophical Investigations, yes, there's this idea of language game, which is cool, connected to form of life, and there's all these interesting examples and and you know, questions that he brings up and family definitions in place of uh, family uh, resemblance definitions and stuff like that. But it, it, it's a lot of Wittgenstein just kind of circling around interesting questions that he's definitely not the first person to raise, right? But people treated this as if, like, this is the book that you must pass through, right? For existentialism, if it wasn't Heidegger, it was this one being and nothingness, right? This even made its way into movies as sort of like a stand-in for what a true intellectual would be reading. If you've ever seen the movie Roxanne with um, uh, Steve Martin, and I forget who else was in it, there's this, uh, um, this intellectually oriented fireman who this other guy... Uh, who's kind of a hunkish, you know, kind of character. He's supposed to be like, you know, very attractive. He goes in and he buys this book at the bookstore for the other guy. And then the main female lead thinks, oh, he's really, really smart. Why? Because this was a stand in for being smart, for considering things. And every, everybody knows like the waiter who's too much of a waiter and, and you know, looking at the pee, the peephole, the keyhole, right? People know those sorts of examples, but that's just a tiny little bit of what's actually going on in this very interesting book. All of these are what we call books with, I call them books with aura. People used them or use them as sort of stand-ins for what it means to uh, have a comprehensive worldview and to be an intellectual and, you know, to look at things philosophically. I have a few other ones as well that I, I want to bring up. One of which is probably no longer, it doesn't have the aura that it used to have, but, you know, back when I was in graduate school, this was considered hot stuff, you know, on grammatology. I, I'm, I mean, I remember reading my way through it in uh, the French uh, original that my, my mom had bought me and then, you know, talking with other people who were using this, uh, uh, you know, version as well. And it's cool, you know, it's, it's great, but it's, you know, sort of like Hegel's Phenomenology or Spinoza's Ethics or the first critique of, you know, Immanuel Kant. It's great, but it's not the single book that we should all look to and talk about. This one kind of has fallen out of prominence, but there's another book from, you know, the same era that people are still constantly referencing and talking about. And again, not knocking these books, they're worth reading, but do a lot of people who read Anti-Oedipus and talk about it really fully understand it? Or is it more like I'm on team Deleuze and Guattari and I'm going to talk a lot about the body without organs and, you know, bring up uh, schizoanalysis and, you know, all, all that sort of stuff. And that, that could be another way of talking about these books with aura. They, the people who treat them that way, they treat it as if these are emblems, mascots, uniforms for a team that they are on. And I'll bring up another one that has a similar sort of thing. Another book that a lot of people talk about. I don't think that many people actually do in fact read, because it's a tough read. Lawrence Becker is a new stoicism. Very important for, you know, this paying attention to uh, Stoic philosophy in the 21st century. I mean, it, it, it was a slow burn for it, right? Because when did it first come out? 1998, you know, a little bit before the turn of the century. And it's a, it's a great book, but it is difficult. It is tough. 
And that's before you get to the, um, you know, the appendix with the calculus for normative logic stuff. So I would say that's, that's, you know, another interesting book along these lines. And then, you know, there's many others that we could discuss, but I've said this before, uh, about this particular book that the, uh, the press was kind enough to send me, uh, about a year and a half ago. Nick Land's Fang Numina. I mean, when I, given all the hype around this book, I was a little disappointed when I actually read it because I was like, well, I mean, this is just the sort of typical stuff that we were doing in continental philosophy around the, you know, 1990s and, uh, you know, going back into the 80s and the turn of the century. Um, it's not bad, but it's not brilliant. And it's not like, the book that we need to read in order to understand or grasp our situation for everything any more than is being in nothingness or, you know, um, the critique of pure reason or any of these others. And it, it gets brought up a lot by people who I think haven't read very closely this book or the people that it's referencing, right? So there's a lot of uh, cool talking about like, you know, Bataille and Derrida and Deleuze and Heidegger and Kant and, you know, weird things where it's like, you know, kind of a computer code and all these interesting reflections on the possibilities for AI and, you know, uh, the planet itself and all that. But it's, I mean, I think it's, it's not the text to understand everything with. So we got a whole bunch of things that if, if you've got a better word for these kinds of texts that isn't demeaning, saying, oh, they're all just, you know, gibberish or gobbledygook or, you know, uh, charlatanry or something like that, because they definitely aren't. Every single one of these texts, I would say, is worth reading, even if they're texts that, you know, myself, I would say I, I definitely don't agree with. These are all interesting. These are all worthwhile. I don't want to put them down, but they definitely don't give you what it is that it seems a lot of people attribute to them, particularly people who don't seem to have read them at all or read them very carefully. And so I, I wouldn't say avoid them. Definitely read them if you have the time, but don't feel like your life is somehow meaningless or incomplete or empty or, you know, less uh, well guided if you haven't read these texts, because none of them are the blueprint for everything. So that's where I'll leave off. I would be very interested to see if other people have better suggestions for a way to name this kind of phenomenon and these kinds of texts. And so if you, if you have any suggestions, uh, feel free to leave them in the comments and I'm happy to entertain them.